Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Mario Ritter, Jill Robbins, Dan Novak, and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Mario Ritter. The Thanksgiving holiday is when Americans try to spend time with family, eat a tasty meal, and give thanks for the meaningful things in life. This year, the holiday falls on November 25th. The historical facts of the holiday, however, have long been debated. Ramona Peters is a historic preservation officer of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe in the state of Massachusetts. The Native American group was part of what is said to be the first Thanksgiving in 1621. She describes the first Thanksgiving this way. In the fall of 1621, Early settlers called pilgrims celebrated their first successful harvest in the New England area of the present-day United States. They celebrated by firing guns and cannons in Plymouth. The noise surprised ancestors of the modern-day Wampanoag nation, so they went to investigate. This is how Native people came to be present at the first Thanksgiving, Peters said. She added that the time was marked by mistrust and tension. The description of the events suggests that paintings showing Native Americans sitting down for a peaceful meal with colonial families is largely a lie. The Wampanoag might have shared food with the pilgrims during their fact-finding mission, but they also hunted for food and probably ate very different things than the foods connected with today's Thanksgiving holiday. What was actually eaten at that first Thanksgiving was likely much different than the turkey, potatoes, and stuffing that many American families eat today. That information comes from an expert at Plymouth Plantation, a living history museum in Plymouth, Massachusetts. We know turkey was plentiful in Plymouth Colony, but we don't know for certain that it was served at the meal. Plymouth Plantation's Kate Sheehan told VOA in an email, She also believes seafood might have been among the foods served. Mussels, lobster, and eel were available as well, and enjoyed by both the English and Wampanoag. Plymouth Plantation attempts to copy the Plymouth Colony settlement established by English colonists in the 1600s. Modern experts can make educated guesses about what might else have been on the first Thanksgiving table. It is likely that many kinds of vegetables and herbs were among the available foods. English gardens probably produced cabbages, carrots, cucumbers, colewort or collards, parsnips, turnips, beets, onions, radishes, lettuce, and spinach, as well as sage, thyme, parsley, marjoram, fennel, anise, and dill, Sheehan said. Americans now celebrate Thanksgiving on the fourth Thursday in November, but historians do not know the date of the very first Thanksgiving. 
We know it took place over three days, sometime between mid-September and early November in 1621, and was considered a harvest celebration following a successful planting of multicolored flint corn or maize, Sheehan explained. It was not until 1863, during the Civil War, that Thanksgiving became a national holiday. Some explanations say President Abraham Lincoln supported the idea of an idealistic Thanksgiving in hopes of bringing the country together. Peters, of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, said a woman named Sarah Josepha Hale had a part in the holiday's development. Hale was the editor of an influential women's magazine. She said Hale had told President Lincoln that a national Thanksgiving holiday would help unite the war-torn country. It was a socio-political move to try to reunite the North and the South after the Civil War to have this national holiday, Peters said. It was actually a pretty smart move to establish something to unite families. During the Civil War, a lot of families actually split down the middle, brothers against brothers. Today, Native Americans mark Thanksgiving in different ways. Some consider it a day of mourning because of the destruction that colonization and displacement caused for their people. Others gather with their families, but they do not think about the pilgrims. Peters said Native people celebrate many things throughout the year. They celebrate when certain crops come in or when fish return to release their eggs in nearby waters. Giving thanks, Peters added, is a big part of the Wampanoag members' spiritual life. I'm Jill Robbins. And I'm Mario Ritter. The South Korean superstar music group BTS was named Artist of the Year at the American Music Awards on Sunday. It was the group's first time taking the top prize. Taylor Swift, Drake, and The Weeknd were also nominated for Artist of the Year. BTS has been one of the most commercially successful bands in the world over the past several years. The group's 2020 album, B, was its fifth album to reach the top of the Billboard 200 music charts. It was the fastest any group has released five albums at the top of the Billboard 200 charts since the Beatles in the 1960s. BTS member RM said Sunday after receiving the award, Seven boys from Korea, united by love for music, met the love and support from all the armies all over the world. The biggest BTS fans are called the group's army. This whole thing is a miracle, RM added. Seriously, we would never take this for granted. The seven-member K-pop group won three awards Sunday. It was also named Favorite Pop Group or Duo. The group's hit Butter won the Favorite Pop Song Award. The group performed their number one single, My Universe, with the rock group Coldplay. They ended the show with a performance of Butter, which also went number one. BTS has now won nine American Music Awards. The fan-voted awards show was broadcast live from Los Angeles, California. Nominees were based on streaming, album and digital sales, radio play, and social activity. I'm Dan Novak. El Salvador says it plans to build the world's first Bitcoin city. The city to be created in the eastern area of La Union 
will be powered by a nearby volcano, President Naib Bukele recently announced. The announcement came during an event held as part of the country's week-long Latin American Bitcoin and Blockchain Conference. In September, El Salvador became the first country in the world to make Bitcoin a legal currency. The country has used the U.S. dollar for more than 20 years. Bukele said the planned city would be financed with bonds linked to virtual currencies, also known as cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is the world's biggest cryptocurrency. El Salvador plans to issue $1 billion worth of Bitcoin bonds in 2022, said Samson Mo, who appeared at the event with Bukele. Mo is an executive with Blockstream, a blockchain technology provider. After the financing is ready, the building of the Bitcoin city could begin within 60 days, Bukele said. Mo added that the city could make El Salvador the financial center of the world. The city is to be built near the Conchagua Volcano. Officials said the volcano will produce geothermal energy to power both the city and the Bitcoin mining process. Geothermal power centers capture high heat from below Earth's surface. The heat creates steam that can turn machines to produce electricity. Bitcoin mining is the process by which new Bitcoin is created using computers that solve complex mathematical problems. The mining process requires huge amounts of energy. Bukele said the project would create a fully ecological city that works and is energized by a volcano. The government said it will provide land, infrastructure, and low taxes to gain investors. The only tax to be collected will be a value-added tax. Bukele said there would be no property, income, or local taxes. He added that the city is expected to add no carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. The government is already operating a Bitcoin mining test project. It is near another geothermal area beside the Tecapa volcano in the eastern part of the country. The government plans to use half of the new tax it collects to finance the bonds sold to build the city. The other half would be used to pay for local services. Bukele estimated that public infrastructure projects would cost about 300,000 bitcoins. The goal of the city will be to bring in new foreign investments. Bukele invited companies from around the world to join the project and promised that such efforts would pay off. Invest here and make all the money you want, he said. The city is expected to include housing, stores, restaurants, and a port, the president said. He also talked about plans to offer digital education and public transportation that does not harm the environment. The government is currently supporting Bitcoin with a $150 million fund. To get Salvadorans to use it, the government offered $30 of credit 
to those using the currency's digital wallet. Bitcoin was first created to operate outside of government-controlled financial systems. The Salvadoran government has said Bitcoin could reduce the cost for Salvadorans living in foreign countries to send money home to their families. I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. Surrender finally came for General Robert E. Lee and the Confederacy he had served as a great soldier. It was mostly his military skill and intelligence that kept the South in the field so long. But even his extraordinary skill could not save the South from the industrial power of the North and its mighty armies, armies that were well-fed and well-equipped. Stuart Spencer and Leo Scully continue the story of the American Civil War. The last chapter of the bitter four-year struggle came in April 1865. General Grant had pushed Lee's army away from Richmond and nearby Petersburg, Virginia. His Union forces had kept after the Confederates for almost a week. Lee fled westward across Virginia. His tired, hungry soldiers tried to turn south to reach safety in the Carolinas. But always, the Union Army blocked the way. Finally, on Saturday, April 8th, Lee's army found it could flee no farther. A Union force at Appomattox Station blocked any further movement to the west. Early the next morning, Lee tried to break through the ring of Union soldiers that surrounded his army, but he failed. Nothing was left, nothing but surrender. Lee sent a note to General Grant, asking to meet with him to discuss surrender terms. A few hours later, General Grant rode into the crossroads village of Appomattox Courthouse. General Lee was waiting for him at the home of a man named Wilmer McLean. Lee rose as Grant walked into the house. Grant did not look like a great military leader, the chief of all Union armies. He was dressed simply. His clothes were the same as those worn by the lowest soldiers in his army. His boots and pants were covered with mud. His blue coat was dirty and wrinkled. But on its shoulders were the three gold stars of the Union's highest general. Lee was dressed in his finest clothing. He wore a beautiful gray coat with a red sash tied around it. At his side he carried an ivory and silver sword. The two generals greeted each other and shook hands. Grant said, I met you once before, General Lee, while we were serving in Mexico. I have always remembered your appearance. I think I would have recognized you anywhere. Lee said, Yes, I know I met you then, and I have often tried to remember how you looked but I have never been able to remember a single feature. Grant continued to talk of their service in the Mexican War. He said later that he did so because he was finding it difficult to bring up the question of surrender. 
Lee took part in the light talk for several minutes. Finally, he said, I suppose, General Grant, that the purpose of our meeting is fully understood. I asked to see you to learn upon what terms you would receive the surrender of my army. Grant answered, The terms I propose are those I offered in my earlier note to you. That is, the officers and men surrendered will not take up arms again, and all your weapons and supplies will become captured property. Lee said those were the conditions he had expected. He asked Grant to put the terms in writing so he could sign them. Very well, said Grant. I will write them out. It took him several minutes to write the surrender agreement. Only once did he look up. He had just written the sentence, The arms, artillery, and public property will be given over to the Union Army. Grant stopped writing and looked over at the sword the old general wore. He decided there was no need to hurt Lee's pride by taking away his sword. So he added, This will not include the side arms of the officers, nor their horses, or other private property. Each officer and man shall be allowed to return to his home. He will not be disturbed by United States authorities as long as he honors this agreement and obeys the laws where he lives. Grant gave the paper to Lee. Lee read it slowly. When he finished, Grant asked if the Confederate general wished to propose any changes. Lee was silent for a moment. There is one thing, he said. The cavalrymen and artillerymen in our army own their own horses. I would like to understand if these men will be allowed to keep their horses. You will find, Grant said, that the terms as written do not allow it. Only the officers are permitted to take their private property. You are correct, said Lee. I see the terms do not allow it. That is clear. Until now, Lee's face had shown no emotion. But for a moment, his self-control weakened. Grant could see how badly Lee wanted this. Well, said Grant, I did not know that any private soldiers owned their horses. But I think that this will be the last battle of the war. I sincerely hope so. I think that the surrender of this army will be followed soon by that of all the others. I take it that most of your soldiers are small farmers and will need the horses to put in a crop that will carry themselves and their families through the next winter. I will not change the terms as they are written, but I will tell my officers to let all the men who claim to own a horse or mule take the animals home with them to work their little farms. Lee was pleased with this. He told Grant, This will have the best possible effect upon the men. It will be very gratifying and will do much to help our people. While waiting for the surrender papers to be copied, Grant presented Lee to the other Union officers in the room. Lee had known some of them before the war. After a few minutes, Lee turned to Grant. He told him that his army held about 1,000 Union soldiers as war prisoners. He said that for the past few days... He had no food but cracked corn to give them. He said he had nothing to give his own men to eat. 
Grant called in his supply officer and ordered him to feed the Confederate Army. He told him to send to Lee's army enough food for 25,000 men. Finally, the surrender papers were ready. Grant and Lee signed them. Lee shook hands with Grant and walked out of the house. Lee got on his horse and rode slowly back to his army. As he entered Confederate lines, men began to cheer, but the cheering died when the soldiers saw the pain and sorrow in Lee's face. Tears filled the old man's eyes. He could not speak. Soldiers removed their hats and watched silently as Lee rode past. Many wept. A crowd of soldiers waited at Lee's headquarters. They pushed close around him, trying to touch him, trying to shake his hand. Lee began to speak. Boys, I have done the best I could for you. Go home now, and if you make as good citizens as you have soldiers, you will do well. I shall always be proud of you. Goodbye, and God bless you all. From the crowd came a loud cry. Farewell, General Lee. I wish for your sake and mine that every damned Yankee on earth was sunk ten miles in hell. On the other side of the lines, Union soldiers began to celebrate. Artillerymen fired their guns to salute the victory over Lee. Grant heard the artillery booming and sent orders that it should stop. The rebels are our countrymen again, he said. We can best show our joy by refusing to celebrate their downfall. General Grant left Appomattox Courthouse to return to his headquarters a few kilometers away. Suddenly, he stopped his horse. He had forgotten to tell President Lincoln or War Secretary Stanton that Lee had surrendered. He sat down at the side of the road and wrote a telegram to Secretary Stanton. News of the surrender reached Washington late on Sunday. Most citizens in the capital did not learn of it until early the next morning. Then cannons began to boom out over the city. Crowds rushed to the White House to cheer the president. They asked Lincoln to make a victory speech. Lincoln said he had not prepared a statement. He wished to wait until the next night. He asked the people to come back then, and he would have something to say. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 